Thank you. Hi everybody. My name's Colleen. I, as you heard, teach at Auckland University of Technology. I'm in the School of Science at AUT and I'm an Associate Professor of Molecular Genetics. I teach second and third year and postgraduate level molecular genetics as well as ethics. And I research in the area of plant viruses, evolution and host interactions. Not human viruses like COVID-19 virus, but there are lots of similarities between human viruses and plant viruses and how they work. I'm also interested in, in, in environmental microbiology and I supervise a quite a large number of postgraduate students and carry out research in plant viruses. So I'm here today to talk to you about COVID-19, what causes it, and what the life cycle is of the virus that causes the disease, and then talk about the immune response that the virus leads to, the development of different types of vaccinations, and how um, we might think about herd immunity and what would be needed. Okay, so COVID-19 is an acronym that stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. So it's caused by a coronavirus and it was first identified in late 2019. We want to compare it to seasonal flu to get an idea of how serious this disease actually is. Seasonal flu is the flu that we see most winters and quite a lot of people get infected by. So seasonal flu has an mm. R naught number and I'm going to talk about R naught numbers in a little bit uh, more detail in a minute. But the R naught number is basically the number of infections that on average would occur as a result of transmission from one person. So if I was infected mm -hmm. with COVID-19, then I would, uh, sorry, if I was infected with flu, I would on average be spreading it to 1.3 people. But if I had COVID-19, I would on average be transmitting it to 2 to 2.5 people. And in some places, that number is as high as 6 or 7, depending on the um, measures that have been put in place to try and contain the disease. The incubation time for flu, if we see day one as the infection day, uh, is around 1 to 4 days. But for COVID-19, it can be up to 14 days post-infection. And that's why we have this fortnight stand down period. Once we hear about community transmission, we need to make sure that we get through that 14 day period. The hospitalization rate is quite different between uh, flu and COVID. So for flu, it's around 2% of people. So two out of every hundred, you would expect to go into hospital as a result of having contracted flu. But for COVID-19, it's around 20%. So 20 people in 100. So 10 times the number of people would be expected to go into hospital if they contract COVID-19. But what's particularly alarming about COVID-19 is the case fatality rate. For flu, it's around 0.1% or less. So one person in 1,000 would be um, expected to die as a result of contracting seasonal flu. But for COVID-19, it's at least 10 times that, if not 34 times that. So it's 1 to 3.4 percent. So that's 10 to 34 people out of 1,000 that you would predict would die as a result of contracting COVID-19. So the um, data presented on this slide is uh, what the data was when I downloaded it on the 2nd of April. So the number of confirmed cases around the globe are around 128 and a half million cases. And we can see from the beginning of the pandemic up until the present day that we've seen a steady increase in the number of cases and a recent dip and possibly another increase coming. And we can see that um, the number of deaths is around 2.8 million people. We had quite a lot of deaths at the beginning while we were scrabbling around trying to figure out how to contain this disease. And then it's steadied, um, steadied uh, out over a period of time and has increased again and then gone down again. So it's fluctuating over time. If we look at the number of cases by region, we can see in the Americas, which in South, North and South America and Central America, We've got around 56 million cases there and we can see in the orange here that those cases have been steadily increasing, a recent decline and now another increase. And then for Europe, around 45 million cases, we see a very similar pattern occurring. 
And the increases is largely due to the restriction measures that have or have not been put in place in the countries that are being um, analysed here. Deaths by region, we see that the majority of deaths have occurred in the Americas. About 1.3 million people in the Americas have passed away as a result of COVID-19. A lot of deaths initially, again, as we were coming to grips with what was necessary to try and keep people safe and well, and a steadying out and then an increase in the number of deaths again as restrictions started to be relaxed and so forth. And we see the same pattern in Europe also. So that pattern of um, death is also following roughly the pattern of infection. The reproduction number or R naught is an important mathematical term because it is a measure of how contagious a disease actually is. So it, if, if, if an infection is transmitted from one person to another, that virus is going to replicate in that person and then go on to infect other people as well. And so the R naught number tells you the average number of people who will contract that disease from an individual. So um, this will only apply when everyone in the population is completely vulnerable to the, dis to the disease. So this means that no one has been vaccinated, no one has had the disease before, and there is no way to control the spread of the disease. This was the scenario at the beginning of the pandemic. We've since started to get on top of it with, more, with restrictions and now vaccinations. But for, by and large, over, over more recent times, this combination of conditions has become more rare because of advances in medicine. But when we get exposed to a new disease like COVID-19, then um, you know we, we would find ourselves in this situation again. The R naught number is a very important measure for public health because it helps us to figure out how quickly the virus will spread around the population and then what level of vaccination is necessary to achieve herd immunity. So the R naught value, if it was less than one, would mean that if I was infected with COVID-19, I would be on average infecting fewer than one person at a time when I'm, when I'm with them. So in this case, the disease would be expected to decline and eventually die out. If R naught is equal to one, then I'm infecting one person on average myself. And so that would allow the disease to become stable within the population, but wouldn't be an outbreak or an epidemic. But when R naught is greater than one, that means I am spreading the infection to on average more than one person at a time, then that um, is going to mean the disease is being transmitted quite well between people and it could lead to an outbreak or an epidemic or as we've seen for COVID-19, a pandemic. So how contagious is COVID-19? The graph on the right hand side is showing us on the x-axis R naught values in the range of three to about nine. And we can see down the y-axis are different countries. So we've got the US and the UK and various locations in Europe. These graphs are showing a range of R naught values across the US or across the UK and so forth with the mean value uh, shown in red. So we can see for the US that the R naught value is about six and for Spain, it's over six. And then for other locations, it's lower than that. If we were to take the R naught values across, as an average across the globe, then we see the R naught value is around two to three. But what this graph is actually showing is that the R naught value can vary from location to location. And that depends on the measures that are put in place to protect people from transmission. So how does this compare to other diseases? Common flu, as I've said, has an R naught value of 1.3. So on average, one infected person will infect 1.3 people. For measles, it's very high. It's around 15 to 18. So if I was infected with measles, I would be expected to infect at least 15 other people. So we can see the R naught vary, can vary between locations and it can depend on many things, how often people, for example, are coming into contact with one another. So COVID-19 is caused by a virus. So let's think now about what a virus actually is. Virus particles consist of two or three parts. 
It has a genome or genetic material that is made up of DNA or RNA. Ours is DNA. Viruses can have either DNA or RNA, never both. And viruses are the only life form that have RNA as, its, as a genome. Our DNA is double-stranded, but for viruses it can be single-stranded or double-stranded. Now that genetic material is surrounded by a protein coat called capsid that protects it. So here is some uh, um, viral genome here, viral nucleic acid surrounded by a uh, capsid here, um, nucleic acid with the protein coat around it to protect it. So they're the two basic components of a virus and some viruses also have an envelope of lipids or a fatty membrane that surrounds the outside of the capsid and that's for further protection and to help evade the immune system and also has um, spike proteins that stick through the membrane. This electron micrograph is showing a virus without an envelope. This one is showing a virus with an envelope so it looks a little bit fuzzier. Now viruses are not cells, they don't have cellular organisation. They rely on their host cells to allow them to replicate. So they take over the cell's machinery to ensure that their genome can be replicated, that they can get their proteins produced and so forth. Most viruses that we know of are what we call obligate intracellular parasites. So a parasite is something that is going to take from the host cell. And it's intracellular because it's inside the cell and it's obligate because it's, it's, it, has, it has to work. It has to go into a host cell for it to work. Not all viruses we realize now are parasites. Some are just sitting there in the host not doing much. Some are potentially beneficial to the host. But SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that it causes COVID-19 is a virus that is an obligate intracellular parasite. And as for all viruses, they're unaffected by antibiotics. Antibiotics are designed to target um, primarily bacteria. Viruses can vary in shape. So we've got uh, four basic shapes for viruses, helical, icosahedral, spherical, and complex. The COVID-19 virus is a spherical type virus. They vary in size. So this red blob here represents a red blood cell in size compared to a bacterium E. coli. And these other pictures are showing different viruses and their sizes. So a tiny one here, a bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria. They kind of look like this structure here. Uh, some of them do. And then we have um, these bacteriophages, which is this structure here. These other bacteriophages are slightly different structure. And then these are the tiny ones. And then we have these large ones, such as the Ebola virus. This is a very big virus. The COVID-19 virus is shown here. So it's not the smallest virus and it's certainly not the biggest virus. So it's somewhere in between. Viruses may or may not have an envelope. So we've got here across the table DNA um, viruses and then we've got RNA viruses. And we've got in the columns enveloped and non-enveloped. So we've got a whole variety of different shapes and sizes and we can see that the type of genome, the size and the shape of the virus don't correlate with whether or not they have an envelope or not. Now the cause of COVID-19 is a virus called Severe Acute Respiratory Coronavirus 2, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we call it SARS-CoV-2. And it's the second severe acute respiratory coronavirus that we found to infect humans. So SARS-CoV-2 is the cause of COVID-19 um, disease. It's a coronavirus. This is an electron microscope picture of uh, coronaviruses of SARS-CoV-2. We can see that, um, what it looks like. The first person to discover coronaviruses thought that they looked like a crown. And so corona means crown, so that's why they're called coronaviruses. This is a picture representing what SARS-CoV-2 looks like. It's, as I said, spherical, and it has all of these proteins sticking out of its surface. If we were to slice it down the middle, we would see inside is the RNA genome with its coat capsid uh, protectant. And then around that is this membrane and through the membrane are um, projecting uh, lots of proteins that um, are important for the virus to infect cells and to replicate and so forth. 
The most important of those is the spike protein here, which is shown in pink. So if we look at my tennis ball, this could represent inside is the RNA genome, and this is the protein coat on the outside of it. Then the paper would represent the oops, would represent the lipid envelope, and the tacks poking through represent the spike protein. Does anybody want to catch COVID-19? <laughs> okay, so we've got these proteins sticking through the virus. These are important for it to get into the cells, as we'll see in a minute. Where did the virus come from? The current thinking is that the virus originated in bats. There are a lot of viruses that are in bats, and we are, um, and some of those have actually spread into the human population in the past. Now, it looks like the um, virus may not have jumped directly from the bat into humans, but used an intermediate host. So what may have happened is that the bats were infected with SARS-CoV-2, those viruses underwent mutation to be able to infect other animal species such as the pangolin. And it's the pangolin that is thought to have transmitted the virus into humans in Wuhan in the original infection. And that would have occurred because that virus had other mutations that now allowed it to jump into humans. There's a lot of work going on to try and understand the origin of the virus and there's been a team of scientists that have gone into China recently to try and uncover the, how this virus appeared in the human population. This is current thinking but my sense is that this may change and uh, as we learn more when, from people who have been on the ground looking around Wuhan and South China to see what might have happened to cause this virus to jump into humans. SARS-CoV-2, as I said, has an RNA genome. So if this uh, box here represents the RNA of the virus, then that RNA is encoding lots of proteins that the virus needs for its replication. Some of those proteins we call non-structural. And we've got all of, so these, they make these two big proteins that then gets chopped up into smaller proteins that are represented by the different colors. So there's quite a lot of them. There's about 16 of them. Then we also have these structural proteins. Now, the non-structural proteins are necessary for replication and transcription of the genome. The structural proteins are necessary to make the virus particle. So we can see here in this cartoon of the virus, we have our RNA genome and the nuclear capsid or capsid proteins surrounded by the membrane with these other proteins sticking through, in particular the spike protein. Now these proteins sticking through the membrane are the ones encoded by this part of the genome. So we've got the spike protein, the envelope protein, the uh, membrane protein, and the, and the nuclear capsid protein. So these proteins are structural to help make the virus particle. The others are non-structural. They help with the replication and transcription of the virus. The most important protein for this talk today is the spike protein, which is encoded in this region of the genome. So how does SARS-CoV-2 enter the human cell? We breathe the virus into our bodies, and the virus is then exposed to our airway cells. So here we've got an airway cell shown in blue with its plasma membrane around the outside. Now on the surface of those cells is a protein called ACE2, which acts as a receptor for the virus. The spike protein of the virus binds to ACE2. There's a second protein called TMPRSS2, which then also helps to get the virus into the cell. So it helps with membrane fusion of the virus membrane to the plasma membrane of the infected cell and then the virus can inject its RNA into the cell. Now not all cells have an ACE2 receptor so the virus can still enter those cells and so it, we've now come to realize that the virus membrane fuses directly in this manner with the cell membrane um, of the host cell or the plasma membrane. Okay, so this is the most complicated slide. This is the life cycle of the virus. So let's just take us, just walk through slowly through the slide. 
here we've got the virus that's attaching to the outside of the cell. So here is the cell in grey and here is the plasma membrane here. Now as the virus is entering, it will be surrounded by some of the cell's plasma membrane. Now for the virus to actually replicate, the RNA has to come out of the virus. So that plasma membrane will open up and the viral membrane will also open up, those things fuse together, and the RNA will then come out of the virus particle. The first thing that has to happen is that it must make all of these non-structural proteins because it needs these proteins to replicate itself. So the RNA from the virus will be translated as the first thing into the various proteins needed to make copies of the viral RNA. So that viral RNA will be copied to create by this process, we won't worry about the details, but what we end up with is a large number of copies of the viral RNA through that process. At the same time as this RNA is being made, the RNA, the original RNA is also being transcribed into a number of different messenger RNAs that are going to be translated into the different proteins that stick into the viral envelope. One of those is the spike protein. There is also the nucleocapsid protein that's needed to coat the RNA genome. So the non-structural proteins are all these proteins here. They get made first to, in order to replicate this genome here. And then when that is being replicated, it's also being transcribed to make messenger RNA to make these proteins down here. Now those proteins down here are going to be made in this region of the cell which is called the endoplasmic reticulum and it's attached to the nucleus of the cell. So we can see the viral proteins sticking in the mem this is all membranes like just like the plasma membrane but they're inside the cell. And these proteins stick inside the plasma membrane just like they do in the virus membrane. And then they go through, they're processed through this structure which is called the Golgi apparatus. And the reason for that is to create the membrane that surrounds the virus. So they get their membrane from the host cell. So we can see that these proteins are sitting inside this membrane. Some of these are the capsid protein and some of the spike proteins and some of the uh, other proteins. Um, and then these membranes then will start to surround the viral RNA. The capsid protein will break away from the membrane and start attaching to the RNA. And we can see this structure here is now what's going to become the viral membrane. It will surround that RNA. And that whole thing is going to be surrounded by this plasma membrane, like here. So here we've got the RNA bound to the protein the viral membrane now is present with the spike protein sticking through and the plasma membrane here. This plasma membrane will fuse with the plasma membrane of the cell to release that virus and that virus can now go on and infect other cells. So it's a bit complicated but the, the bottom line is that the virus has to make copies of itself. To do that it has to make the proteins first so it does that and then it makes the structural proteins to actually make the virus particle. It will go through the process of making the virus particle and collect a membrane from the host cell on the way through that process. Okay, so now let's look at immune response to the virus and the vaccines and how they might mimic the immune response. So we have the virus infecting a host cell, which is shown here. It'll go through its life cycle as I just described. And then it will be circulating in the body and it will be taken up by a special type of cell called an antigen presenting cell. And that cell will process that virus and will um, take its, uh, S, its spike proteins and push them to the surface of the cell so that it's now sitting on the surface of this antigen presenting cell. Now an antigen is what's necessary to trigger our immune response. The antigen is recognized by the body as being foreign and that's what makes the immune response happen. And the way it does that is that there's a special type of cell in our bodies called a T helper cell that will recognize that spike protein as being foreign. 
and when it's sitting on the surface of one of these antigen presenting cells. And when it does that, it stimulates B cells to produce antibodies that will then be specific to the spike protein, bind to the spike protein and stop the virus from entering the host cell. And that, in that way, it neutralizes the virus. The helper T cell also stimulates the production of cytotoxic T cells that are specific to infected cells that are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Cyto means cell and toxic means toxic. So these types of cells are toxic to other cells, specifically to the virus infected cells. At the same time that this is happening, some of those cells are being laid down in our long-term memory for our immune system. So we have memory cells as part of our immune system. And they help protect us if we're going to be exposed to the virus again at a later stage. So this picture up here is showing a representation of the virus that is coated with antibody. And you can see that the spike proteins are being um, you know, that it's going to be much harder for those proteins to bind to a host cell to infect a cell. Now, if we look at a graph of the immune response, we've got on the x-axis time. So the first part is in days, the second part is in years. And the y-axis is the amount of antibody and T cells. So if we have an infection, there's a bit of a lag phase of about a week before our immune system starts to ramp up. And it takes about a week for this process to occur for us to get our antibodies and our T cell numbers up um, to uh, this level. And then those levels will, it'll start helping protect us against the disease and those levels will, will start to wane. And we will then go into our protective immunity phase where our memory cells get laid down so that if we get infected maybe months, years later, we will see a very sharp increase in the amount of antibody and T cells in response to um, infection by that um, same antigen. Now vaccines mimic that process. We're going to be injecting a vaccine um, at this point here. It'll take a little while for our immune system to um, increase our antibodies and T cells against that antigen that we're introducing into the body and we'll develop protective immunity so that if we get exposed to it at a later stage, we'll have a um, protection from it with our antibodies and T cells. So vaccination is the deliberate exposure to an antigen without um, causing disease. Now, in identifying how good a vaccine is, we need to understand the number of people that can be protected by a vaccine. So you might have heard of this concept of efficacy. So efficacy is, a, is a, the percent reduction in disease in a vaccinated group compared to an unvaccinated group under controlled conditions. So this is about clinical trials. Effectiveness then is a similar, similar measure but happens when a vaccine enters into the real world. So we know about the efficacy of these vaccines that are on the market but we're now starting to learn about the effectiveness because they're now out in the real world. But let's look at efficacy and how we might measure that. If a vaccine has 95% efficacy, what does that really mean? If we have 162 people in a placebo group, meaning they're unvaccinated, and, but they receive a placebo, and eight people in a vaccinated group that all got a disease, got the disease, COVID-19, this would give us 170 cases altogether. Now what we want to know is what was the ability of that vaccine to reduce the disease incidence in the vaccinated group. And to do that, we would say eight out of 170 is approximately 5%. So that means that there was a 95% decrease in disease incidence in that group. Uh, allow release of more virus that will be taken up by the antigen presenting cells. The non-replicating virus will go into the bloodstream and go straight into the antigen presenting cells. And the end result of that is that we see spike protein produced and, and um, presented on the surface of these cells that will then induce the immune response as we've seen already. There are a number of uh, vaccines that are being developed 
of this type of technology. You might have heard of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, there's also the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and there's also one from China and one from Russia. We've got different reported efficacies of these viruses. Storage for these is at four degrees, and some are two shots or two doses, and some are one dose. The storage temperature is important, and I'll talk about that in a minute when I talk about the Pfizer vaccine. A, a, virus, uh, sorry, a vaccine against Ebola virus has just recently been approved, and that virus is a rep, uh, vaccine, sorry, is a replicating viral vector vaccine. There are no other non-replicating viral vectors that have been approved for human use other than the ones that have been developed for COVID, so AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, etc. Nucleic acid vaccines are at the cutting edge of vaccine development. We've never had RNA vaccines before. We've never had DNA vaccines before. So we, not for human use, for, for certain. So a DNA vaccine um, takes the spike protein region of the viral genome and places that as a DNA version into another DNA molecule to create this recombinant molecule here. That DNA would be injected into the body and that DNA needs to go into the nucleus of our cells. It would then be transcribed to produce the spike mRNA, spike protein mRNA, and then translated in the cytoplasm to produce the spike protein that will then go out to the antigen um, presenting cells. And then we would get our immune response as I've described. RNA vaccines are a really exciting development in vaccine production. We've never had RNA vaccine technology in clinical trials until, well, that's not true. We've had clinical trials, but you know the um, use of these vaccines is at a very exciting stage. It's very early. So in these vaccines, we use an RNA molecule that contains the viral RNA as part of it, and it is surrounded by a um, membrane, like a plasma membrane. And that's injected, and that plasma membrane then fuses with our cells, releases the RNA, just like the virus does, and it will be translated directly. It doesn't have to go through this stage here of transcription to make an mRNA. It's an mRNA already. And it will produce the viral proteins that will then end up in the antigen-presenting cells and switch on the immune response, as I've described. Now, there are no DNA vaccines approved for human use yet, um, but there is one for horses against West Nile virus. And other than the COVID-19 uh, vaccines, there have been no RNA vaccines approved for human use. So these are the first ones. They're very exciting developments um, in vaccine production. So we're learning a lot about these types of vaccines um, as we go. Different types of messenger RNA vaccines are the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, and the CureVac vaccine. So this one is still undergoing trials. These vaccines need low temperature, particularly Pfizer requires a minus 70 degrees storage. Um, Moderna is a similar technology, but doesn't require as much, as low a temperature. This could be a problem for getting the vaccine out to more remote locations. And so having a variety of different types of vaccines that can be stored at different temperatures is actually really important. The DNA vaccines are more stable than RNA vaccines, so they can be stored at room temperature and they're undergoing trials at the moment. The protein-based vaccines take the uh, gene for the spike protein from the virus and we use that to produce the protein in the laboratory and it's the protein that we inject rather than the DNA or the RNA. So we inject that protein um, directly into the body, it goes to the antigen presenting cells and it will induce the immune response. We can also make virus-like particles that are a membrane that have the spike protein sticking through it like so looks just like the virus but it doesn't have the other proteins in the membrane and it doesn't have the RNA genome. But we can create something like this and inject that and that will go to the antigen presenting cells and um, cause an immune response. If you've had the hepatitis B vaccine then you've had one of these types of vaccines on the left, the protein subunit. 
if you've had the Gardasil vaccine, which is against human papillomavirus, that's a virus-like particle vaccine that's shown on the right. Two uh, vaccine candidates uh, that follow this type of technology are Novavax and Medicago. Now you might have heard that there are different variants of the virus that are starting to appear. And when the virus is replicating, it's causing mutations or mutations occur as a result of replication. What we're witnessing is evolution in um, real time, basically. So because the virus has a very short life cycle, it will, re it will cause mutations or will have mutations in its genome as a result of replication. Some of those mutations will allow the virus to be a more effective pathogen. Some will um, cause it to be a less effective pathogen and some will have no impact at all. Those that allow it to become more effective may take over the whole population of the virus. And that's what we're seeing with variants such as the UK variants becoming more prevalent in the UK, the South African variant and so on. Some of those variants can also have a major impact on the death rate and the disease rate and the R0 value of the uh, virus. So it's very important that the vaccines are able to protect against these variants. And so there's work being done now to work that out. But in New Zealand, we are committed to four vaccines. The government has purchased four. I've included the Moderna vaccine down here um, because it was one of the very early ones that was approved globally. Um, New Zealand has not purchased any of that particular vaccine. So the, um, they've just purchased even more of the Pfizer vaccine. We now have 10 million courses in New Zealand. So um, the Pfizer vaccine is the vaccine that's being rolled out in New Zealand. If it extends down to younger people such as yourself, then you will likely get the Pfizer vaccine. It is an mRNA vaccine in a lipid nanoparticle and has around 95% efficacy. So it's very high efficacy in controlled trials. Appears to protect against the UK variant and appears to be less effective against the South African variant. The other ones, Johnson & Johnson and uh, AstraZeneca, are both non-replicating vector, uh, virus vector vaccines. They have about the same efficacy and they appear to be effective against the UK variant. The AstraZeneca vaccine, there's some concern that it's not as effective against the South African variant, but there's work being done to work that out for sure. The Novavax vaccine is a protein-based vaccine, again, has high efficacy, and again, um, effective against UK, but potentially less effective against the South African variant. So, interestingly also, that the uh, Johnson & Johnson and Novavax vaccines are single-shot vaccines. The other two, you need two doses for effective vaccination. Okay, so let's have a look at herd immunity. What is that? When a high percentage of the population is vaccinated, it's difficult for an infectious disease to take hold in that population. There are fewer individuals that are uh, not immune to the virus and so it has fewer hosts that it can go into. Herd immunity is really important to protect vulnerable people, so newborn babies, the elderly, or anybody for whatever reason can't be vaccinated. It doesn't protect against all vaccine preventable diseases, and it only prevents, it, sorry, it only protects against vaccines that are, sorry, against diseases that are transmissible between people. An example of one that isn't, um, uh, do, doesn't, um, doesn't provide protection with herd immunity is the tetanus vaccine because we get tetanus from um, bacteria in the environment and we don't transmit it from one person to another so there is no herd immunity that is created by vaccinating against tetanus it only works against people who are um, transmitting the virus to other people now, herd immunity will only work if most people in the population are vaccinated. And so that's when the R0 value becomes very important. We need to know that in order to know what level of vaccination is required. And it also depends on the vaccine preventing transmission. We actually don't know yet if the COVID vaccines will prevent transmission. So we may all get vaccinated, 
but we may still be capable of transmitting the virus, in which case herd immunity would be difficult to achieve. All right, so what is herd immunity? Here we have uh, people in blue are susceptible to the infection, um, people in red are infectious, and people in green are immune. There will always be some people in a population that are, are immune to a pathogen, um, but what we want to look at is what is the impact of vaccination on a population where we have pathogens with different R0 values. If we have a pathogen that has an R0 of 2 and the population is not vaccinated, here we've got two people who are infected and all of these other people who are susceptible. These two people will infect two other people because the R0 value is 2. And those people will in turn infect two people. And pretty soon the whole population or most of the population is going to be infected. If we take the same scenario and achieve 75% vaccination in a population, these green people are now immune. And so these two people who are infected will go on to infect other people. Um, they may or may not show symptoms, but we may, um, but what we can see is that with a high level of vaccination, that infection is very much contained. With the same level of vaccination, but with a pathogen that has an R0 value of five, that means that I can, a person who's infected like perhaps me, can infect five people. With a 75% vaccination rate, then we can see that each of these two infected people can infect five other people. And so we'll start to see more spread of the virus through the population, but it is somewhat contained because the majority of the population is vaccinated. And so it will um, protect, in general, the population. We can see some people here who haven't been um, vaccinated and haven't caught the disease, and they're protected to some degree by the level of vaccination in the population. But you can see that by having a different R0 value, you end up with different levels of infection in a population, even when it's vaccinated. So how do we calculate what level of vaccination we need? We use this equation and we plug in our R0 value into the equation. For seasonal flu, that value is 1.3. So that means that we need a 23% vaccination level in the population to achieve herd immunity. For measles, the R0 value is 15 to 18. So if we plug in 18, that tells us we need 88% vaccination to get herd immunity against measles. For COVID-19, R0 is two to three. So if we take the higher value, then we need to achieve 67% vaccination. And so you might've heard a number of 70% being bandied about. That's where that comes from. We need about 70% vaccination to achieve herd immunity. Now, it's very hard to get herd immunity on a global scale. We might be able to achieve it in New Zealand, but difficult on a global scale. First of all, the R0 values vary from place to place. The level of vaccination you need in one place may not be the same as in another place. Uneven vaccine rollout. Not everybody's getting it at the same time, or not everybody's getting it in the same, um, in the, you know, the same rate, so it might have an effect on the uh, development of that immunity. Some people don't end up taking the second dose of the vaccine if it's a two-dose vaccine. Life gets in the way, they never get it done. Some people are nervous about getting vaccinated in the first place, and with the new variants, they may be evading immunity. They may not be, um, the vaccine that you get may not provide enough immunity against those variants. And also, immunity through vaccination doesn't always last forever. Some vaccines give you lifelong protection, some don't. And we don't know yet about the COVID-19 vaccines, particularly the RNA vaccines, how long it will that protection last for. And then also, we have to be mindful about our behaviour after we're vaccinated. Some people might think that they're bulletproof and that they're now protected and that they can go out and be living their life as it was pre-COVID-19. But we don't know yet if the vaccines will stop transmission. And until we know that, it's difficult to be um, sure. So what we do know is that without 
a high level of vaccination, there is no herd immunity. So if I could just quickly show you this last slide that I have. This is a website that um, shows on the left hand side is a family tree of the different um, versions of the virus. So each dot represents a virus that has been isolated and sequenced and the colour represents where in the world it came from and the size of the circle represents how many individuals have got uh, the virus in those locations. So this is December and this uh, 2019, this is March this year. You can see that it exploded really quickly around the globe. And you can see in the US where it's red and a big circle, you can see where those isolates are in this family tree. So we can understand the relationships between the different strains of the virus. So you can see over time, what's been happening with the population of the virus. So we understand when, when these variants appeared and how they're related to other sequences and it helps us track exactly where those viruses have moved around the globe. So we can see that the vast majority of cases were, have been in the US and South America and in Europe as well. This is a very cool website so you know you've got the web link in the slides please take some time to have a look at it some great resources there not just for COVID-19 but for other virus infections as well and just as a last thing this this line down here shows the, the mutations in the genome this line represents the genome the vast these each of these little lines here represents different mutations you can see there's a lot here any thoughts as to where what gene of the virus this might be what's the protein I've been talking about spike protein. So this is where the spike protein is and so most of the mutations in the virus occur in that protein because that protein is so important for getting into the cells and if it can make that job better for the virus then that sequence will start to become more prevalent in the virus population. All right so thanks everyone. Um, talked about a few things today and I hope it's been interesting. So I've talked about the disease, the virus, immune response, vaccination, and herd immunity. So I hope you found that helpful and interesting. And tomorrow we'll talk about a discussion about a topic to do with vaccination. Thanks, everybody. Thank